Hi, my name's Mark Payne from SFL Group. Uh, I'm here in one of our prep rooms and we've been putting together some uh, test environments to look at the usage of uh, Waves Multirack Native. And we're running that, in this case, with a Midas M32 uh, console that you can see over here. So uh, what's the point? I'll just go over the board and just show you a little bit more of what we set up. Um, what's the point of Multirack Native? Well, um, using Multirack Native, we can, we can host um, uh, really fantastic Waves plugins in an environment that's really applicable for the live sound engineer. It means that you can build a, um, an outboard effects rack which will stay consistent and of high quality independent of the kind of mixer that you're using. It doesn't matter whether you're using a Midas Pro 1 or a Pro 2 or a, a, a Yamaha LS9 or a QL or a CL or a, um, um, or, or a Behringer X32 or a Midas M32. It doesn't matter. We're going to make sure that our critical um, outboard effects are going to say con consistent. So the way this has been um, uh, set up, we've got uh, Midas M32 and it's very simply connected to the Mac Mini that's running the multi-rack program using a USB cable. Uh, in this case, this desk comes with a standard 32-channel USB sound interface, which will allow me to send 32 channels one way and 32 channels back. So this, in effect, is our, is our effects loom uh, to allow us to patch in uh, a, um, a load of effects. And um, I've set up a Waves multi-rack environment on the Mac Mini. By the way, this isn't a very special machine. It's four or five years old. And this Waves environment is going to be running... I'm going to show you some fantastic reverbs. The IR Live, uh, a delay, and the C6 multiband compressor, and the L3 maximizer for the final output bus. Um, all of this equipment we sell here at SFL. We're also a hire company and production company. You can hire it and use it on your events also. Um, so, some things are going on here. I'm going to show you inserting the Wave C6 compressors into the input on the mixing desk. I'm also going to show you the L3 maximizer on the main left-right output bus. And I'm going to show you these um, reverbs which we've done by sending them out on an auxiliary and we come back on a pair of channels. That's the traditional way of having reverbs attached to a mixing console. Um, over here I've got a PC and all this PC is doing is it's measuring uh, time delays and latencies because I want to discuss with you the latency of using outboard effects which are DSB based on an external device. Uh, I'm running tuning capture uh, software here which normally in the field I will use to align PA systems but I'm using it here to make these kind of lab based measurements to inform your thinking in terms of latency. Okay so that's the basic setup uh, uh, let's get uh, to it so um, in this um, uh, multi-rack environment I've got two reverbs rack one is a short reverb for maybe drums rack two is a longer reverb for vocals Rack 3 is a delay. Rack 4 is a doubler. I forgot to mention that I was going to show you a doubler. Uh, rack um, 5 is the C6 compressor that's running on this microphone, except it's not inserted at the moment. So although you can see uh, it metering, you're not actually hearing it because it's bypassed. <coughs> then I've got another C6. And finally, we're running on the main left-right bus a maximizer. So that's the rack and if you want to see any of the effects in detail you you click on the effect and it will pop up there it is that's my reverb unit and in fact if you want to hear that and I I kind of need to hear it too otherwise I can't hear what you hear uh, I'm going to select my uh, microphone bus one is sending to that reverb and you can clearly hear uh, that's a kind of short plate that I might use for a drum kit. Now what I've done with this fantastic uh, IR Live reverb program, what I like to do is I tend to use the Lexicon 480 as the model. And so what you can do is for free actually, and I, you know, if you speak to us here at SFL, I'll show you how to do this. You can download 
the impulse responses of the Lexicon 4 ATL, and that becomes the, um, the presets that I use to feed into this reverb unit. So the first one that you can see here, I'll use that for drums. And if I close that down and show you the second one, Uh, this one is a slightly longer one that I've got on auxiliary too. And I'll use that for vocals. Obviously I'm overemphasizing it at the moment just so that you can hear it. I'll just turn it down a bit so we don't destroy the intelligibility of what I'm trying to communicate with you. So quite um, uh, simply we get a reverb time to manipulate. You can see there I've shortened it to around 0.9 of a second. Here you can see 1.9 seconds, you can go nice and long, 3.3 seconds, and we can change the EQ of this. I've taken some low end out, let's put some high end in. So we can change those characteristics. So that's the idea of multi-rack. Uh, I've just turned that reverb down. Don't feel that you need to be going in all the while to actually hear the effect. The effect is driven from the console, just as you would expect it to be. Here's the long one. So that's a shareable effect using the bus as you would normally do. Here's the delay look. Going on a ping pong. If you want to just see what that looks like, it's here. we can change the time just by tapping it in. One of the things I like to do, I'll get rid of that because that's very confusing, is uh, I have a MIDI controller which comes into the computer and you can arm that tap to be from your MIDI tap. Uh, okay, a final thing that I've got here on a bus send is a doubler and with this, if you have a listen, here we go, I'm just spinning it now. You can probably hear that double tracking up. And with this, we're able to get these ADT effects. This is Waves Doubler. And you can see that what we're doing is we're detuning and sending that to, a, to the left. And we're doing a different kind of detune to the right. And you can also see that I'm running a modulation program, which is changing and bending that. And by, by doing this, I can get this ADT effect. And obviously you wouldn't make it as obvious as I had it. You would just use it for a bit of thickening, a little bit of reverb. That's that nasty three second one that's gone way too far now. And there you have it, that sort of idea. So that's using um, the uh, bus sends uh, to use time modulation type effects, reverbs and delays as we would do normally. Now, um, the latency issue, however, is not really going to be about that. We don't, we don't mind a little bit of delay or pre-delay on, a, on, a, uh, on an effect send like a reverb or a delay. We're more interested in what happens if we start to route audio through these devices. And to show you that effect, um, what I'm going to do is show you a measurement of latency using tuning capture. And uh, Tuning Capture will send a sweep pulse through the system. And let me just show you how this has uh, been set up. So my, my Tuning Capture computer sends a log sign ch uh, chirp. It comes out of the sound card and into the system. It goes through the system and then it's actually sent back to the sound card again. So we send a noise and then we measure the noise. And effectively Tuning Capture will measure the delay in that. The way in which it's able to do this is it, it has its own loopback reference. If you have a look, I'll show you. It's quite simple to see. It's basically got an output which is feeding back to its own input. That's our time zero reference. Uh, but we've also got an output that goes to the mixing console and then comes back from the mixing console. So this device is measuring the delay of this path against the delay of that path and coming up with the answer for latency. And I use that in acoustic environments, but here we're using in an electronic environment, i.e. There's no, there's no speakers involved in this. We're coming into the mixing desk and directly out again. At the moment, there are no insertable effects that have been plugged in. So we are measuring purely this sound you'll hear. That's um, purely being measured into the mixing console and back out again and you can see along this scale uh, along this scale we have got milliseconds and you can see that the console latency 
that's the time it takes to get through the Midas M32, is one millisecond, just under one millisecond. Now, to be honest, it doesn't really get any better than that. Most consoles that you measure are going to have that kind of latency. Some will be slower in actual fact. This console is running at 48k. You, if you run a console at 96k, you effectively half that latency time. But one millisecond is pretty good. One millisecond in acoustics is about this far. 0.9 of a millisecond for a foot. So if you want to hear one millisecond, if I step away from you by one foot, the sound that you hear will be delayed by another one millisecond. Of course it's not, because I'm talking to you through a DPA and that didn't move reference my, my, my mouth, but um, that shows you that I can measure this. Now if I come to the measurement channel, which is this channel here, and I insert the C6 compressor, so that that's actually, actually actively going to be used, to actually enable the C6 compressor, we have to, let's just have a look on the board again, we have to go out through the USB, through the core I.O. driver of the Mac Mini, through the software and the plug-in DSP of Waves Multi-Rack, back out again, and then we carry on. So there's going to be an inherent loop latency to achieve that sort of thing. How long is it? Would you like to take a guess while we measure it? So let's hit the sweep again. So you can see that now it takes 11 milliseconds to get audio out of the console. Now 11 milliseconds is the equivalent of something like in the order of maybe three meters, uh, three milliseconds per meter. It'd be a bit like if we put the audio through there, a bit, a bit like taking two steps back from the front of house console. That's the extra latency that you would get. Now, is that significant? Well, um, Haas came up with the, the rule of precedence, which says that once we get above around 10 to 20 milliseconds, we can start to, de to detect discrete events. And so you certainly wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to take this signal that's arrived 10 milliseconds late and, mi and mix it with a non-delayed version of the signal. You wouldn't want to do that. But in this console, we will never do that. We're not going to compress this thing through a latency path and remix it with the original. This is a inserted effect. We are going through it. There is no parallel mixing going on in this situation. So... Is 10 to 11 milliseconds uh, acceptable? Well, actually, I think in most circumstances it is. The, the area in which I might have a problem with it is if you give this to somebody using in-ears, they already have a direct path from mouth to ear, which is about that distance. And then we're going to give them another source, which is delayed by something like three meters. And that time error occurs, the mixing happens in their head. They hear a direct transmission path, which is physical, and an audio path, which you've delayed. And that can cause confusion to an in-ear uh, listener. So you might, want to, you might not want to use this technique for in-ears, but this kind of processing delay is totally acceptable for front of house creative mixing. Later on in another tutorial, I'll show you waves running uh, with a multi-rack sound grid system where we basically drive the latency way, way down. But it includes more hardware. The reason I wanted to show you this simplistic system is really you don't have to buy anything to do this other than find yourself a Mac, a Mac computer to run it on and obviously you know, buying the waves multi-rack environment and licensing a few plugins. So that's where we are. Just to show you that this will carry on building, you'll notice on the board we also have an L3 maximizer that can be uh, added to the left-right bus. So I'm going to turn that on now, and the L3 maximizer is down here. Let me just show you it. There it is, and uh, I've inserted it now. So not only have we got to go through the path for the input insert, we also have to go through the path again for the output insert. So let's measure the latency of that. You might want to start thinking how much you think it would be. And hopefully it's no surprise to you that the latency is doubled because we've basically had to go through that journey uh, twice. Now, this latency can be tuned. You'll notice that at the moment, 
we are running with around a 29% system utilisation uh, and we can actually improve our latency by reducing our buffer size. So if we go into the preferences, at the moment we're using a buffer size of 128. If we bring that right down to say 32 even and apply that, this is, this is not as efficient for the computer to do this. So uh, with a smaller buffer size, we've got many more interrupts. And so the CPU utilization will go up. But let's have a look at this 20 odd millisecond latency and see what that's done. Because we've basically made the multi-rack system run faster. So with the multi-rack system running faster, we're going to get a latency which is now down around 13 milliseconds for two passes. So that's a latency for a single plug-in route of around maybe six milliseconds, and that's getting pretty decent. But you will probably need to sustain performance in this. You're going to need a Mac, uh, a Mac Mini or a MacBook Pro, which is probably um, more recent than the last four or five years old, which is what this one certainly is. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea. Now I'm going to just turn these inserts off and as a final act um, I just wanted to show you that we can relate this back to true acoustics and um, for a start off what I do is I will unplug the um, mixing console return and instead of it having a, an electronic return to the um, measurement system we'll make an acoustical return to the measurement system so for us to hear um, these things going on, we're going to have to come through the speaker. So let's do this now. I've, I've put the measurement mic about one meter from the speaker and we will do a sweep. And in doing that sweep, I'm just waiting for the image to pop up. And there it is. Can you see that we have a, um, a delay, a latency in this area of around three milliseconds? And that three milliseconds is basically equating to the little bit of latency that's in here and the couple of milliseconds it took to get from the speaker to the measurement mic. If I double that distance to around two meters and I do it again. you can see that we've added another two or three milliseconds to the latency and that's going to happen every time I step back because the speed of sound through the air is constant it's coming at me at 340 meters per second roughly which equates to around three milliseconds per meter and this technique is how we align PA systems in live venues I mean I'm not using that in this way here so tuning capture is a product that you can buy from us here at SFL and we support it and we'll look after you and give you the right ways of using it to do system alignment and much much more but that's a whole different subject in itself so this was explaining how we could use Waze Multi-Rack native in the lowest possible cost way, in the simplest way uh, with a console to get fantastic quality reverbs and delays and compressors um, without having to use any external additional hardware. Okay, so I've been Mark Payne from SFL Group. Tune in and I'll show you some other things. We're going to move on and look at more complex wave setups using the SoundGrid network. Thank you.